Welcome to our uh, session for one and a half hours on Rangeland Health Restoration Initiative for One World, One Health. The topic is raise awareness about invest and raise awareness about and the investment for Rangeland Health Restoration. First, the session hosts, I'm Hans-Peter Liniger from the World Overview of Conservation Approaches of te and Technologies. And together we do that with uh, our, my colleague. Yeah, good morning. Um, I'm Chris Maguero, uh, working with IUCN. We'd like to welcome you all to the session. And we hope that we'll have very vibrant discussions uh, through the session on One World, One Health and how that applies to residents. So back to you, Hans-Peter. Yes, thank you. So maybe first an etiquette, a few things that we have to keep in mind. So let's try to avoid distractions. Let's all feel comfortable and uh, we mute ourselves, except the video is on. And whenever you uh, yourself or whenever you uh, put something in the chat, please introduce yourself. And there's also this function and of raising the hand. In the office, uh, in the garage of art. Sorry. Yeah. Good. Okay. If you want to say something with any comments, there's the chat room that we can, uh, you can make your information. There's also questions and answers. Please uh, put your questions there and then we'll try to answer during the session and also do it afterwards. Good. Next slide. Okay, maybe we should first say what we are talking about, rangelands. There are quite a number of different definitions. Let me read this one here. Rangelands are spatially defined ecosystems that are dominated by grasses, grass-like plants, combined with various degrees of bush and tree cover that are also predominantly grazed or browsed, and which are used as a natural and semi-natural ecosystem for the production of livestock and safeguarding of wildlife and additional ecosystem services. Next. Okay, maybe a few facts about rangelands. They cover almost half of the Earth's land surface. They host about 20% of the people. Next one. Yes, 20% of the population is in, have high degradation and continue, get the lowest attention for restoration. But yet rangelands in drylands and mountains account, according to us, for the largest restoration opportunities for ecosystems, human and environmental health and economic growth. Next. Good. Now, maybe our session outline. Still remember the title that we would raise awareness, would want to raise awareness about the investment of rangeland uh, health restoration. Good. We first have a video on a, on a global initiative, then nine pitch talks that we pre-recorded, voices from different institutions and partners, then Zoom polls, chats, where you can voice your ideas. We want to have it lively. We also try to go into breakout groups and address four key issues. And then we'll come back and have a, a last session on a joint action. Next. Okay, maybe our four key issues that we're trying to address. The first one is on solutions. So we look at different rangeland use systems. We want to look at local communities and the youth. The second one is to share and use the wealth of knowledge. Third topic is impact, how to monitor awareness raising and evidence-based decision-making. 
And the fourth one is a joint commitment. But we want to see whether we set up a consortium. Good. Okay, now let's start with a video that we just put together, finished last evening. It's a small emotional video that shows us rangelands in motion. Can you play it, please? Thank you for that really beautiful video, Renal. And good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica. I'm part of the GLF team. I'm really happy to be supporting this session on rangelands. So, um, yeah, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We are going to um, have a little Zoom poll now. So this is a very interactive session. We're really happy that you could all join us. Um, so I am going to la launch a poll. And the poll is going to be asking you a question about rangeland management. So you'll see on your screen now, the poll should have, should have appeared. And the question is, why are rangelands and their restoration neglected and good land management is not spreading fast? So we'd just like you to select all from the seven options, which ones you think are the most relevant to answer this question. I hope everyone can see the poll. Do pop a message in the chat if you can't see it. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of moments. You can just click on it. I, I can see already people are answering. So let's see what you all think about rangeland management and why it's often neglected. And thank you for the positive comments about the video. It was, I agree, very beautiful to see all those rangelands around the world. Okay, so I can see that all the voting is, yeah, we're nearly at 50% of everyone in the room voting. So keep going. I'll give you maybe another 30 seconds to have your say. I can see that there is a little bit of a winner at the moment. And in a moment, I will end the polling so we can all see the results, but I'll just give you a little bit more time for those of you that haven't voted yet. Let's see if we can get up to 80% of you voting. Okay, I think. 10 more seconds, last chance. <laughs> and I'm gonna end the poll now and let's have a look at the results. So 
we can see that we have a winner. <laughs> there is not enough awareness about the value of rangelands and their services, which is quite a, a good answer really, because you are all here to help us raise awareness of rangelands. So we really hope at the end of this session, we will have come up together with some really good ideas of how to raise that awareness. And we can also see that we have that are not enough coordinated and combined efforts and actions towards it as well. So thank you very much for that. And now I will hand it over for the next part of the session. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, that's showing a bit what we expected, but uh, we'll look at it later again. Let's go through nine pitch talks that we pre-recorded and you see a number of institutions and people listed here to the four topics that we have, the key issues on solutions, on knowledge, impact, and then uh, a consortium. First, we have three presentations on solutions from Kyrgyzstan, from Egypt, from Kenya, and then two global ones on knowledge, knowledge management, and then two presentations about impacts from uh, Colombia and uh, from, the, from Central Asia. And then in the end, the, uh, the idea about the big data and the grassland uh, dialogue. Good, let's start with these pitch talks. You will see that they will also address other issues. Not all of the presentations will be, will be entirely dealing with that one uh, key issue that, that they are assigned to, but uh, that, these are the main uh, issues that they are raising. Good. We can have these nine pitch talks, please. Since 2010 in Kyrgyzstan, pasture management is decentralized and managed by local communities throughout creating pasture users union. They are responsible for grazing plan development and implementation. In order to restore pasture condition, we are implementing jointly with pasture users rotational grazing, which is based on traditional Kyrgyz approaches. Since the Kyrgyz were nomads for centuries, this system used to work very well. The idea of rotation is to migrate livestock to seasonal pastures in timely manner, such as from spring to summer, autumn and winter pastures in order to make effective use of seasonal vegetation changes in the high altitude pastures. In addition, in some areas, pastoralists also rotate inside the high altitude summer pastures. At the end of the vegetation period, the impact of grazing on pastures is assessed jointly with pastoralists. Thus, in 2020, we achieved an 8% improvement in pasture condition compared to 2019. This approach is not unique and it's not new. It is a well forgotten old traditional approach to pasture improvement that showed the positive effect. Another approach, more modern, is to create community micro reserve in the highlands, including pasture area. In 2019, the first community micro reserve in Kyrgyzstan was established, which includes about 10,000 hectares of pastures to preserve the biodiversity of rangeland vegetation and wildlife, and to enhance income from community-based tourism. This approach is unique because the micro-reserve and their management were established by the pasture users themselves, including grazing limitation, a ban of shooting, a band of collection of rare species of rangeland vegetation. And most importantly, public control is exercised on this territory by the residents of municipalities themselves. All this together created the condition for the return to this territory, the snow leopard. Our community approach is to achieve both production and protection. Sustainable management of marginal rangelands. Very challenging task to be done 
in such an arid environment in the western coastal desert of Egypt. This area is characterized by a group of habitats, and these habitats contain all rangelands. The local community depends really on the resources of these rangelands, and it was important to sustain these rangelands for the, the livelihood of the local community. When we first visited the area, there has been a lot of stresses that are showing in different habitats due to wood cutting and water erosion and overgrazing that are going on in the area. We first started by using the traditional knowledge in order to start sustainable very primitive ones that they used to do in order to direct water to these habitats contains all rangelands the local community depends really on the resources of these rangelands and it was important to sustain these rangelands for the, the livelihood of the local community when we first visited the area, there has been a lot of stresses that are showing in different habitats due to wood cutting and water erosion and overgrazing that are going on in the area. We first started by using the traditional knowledge in order to start the sustainable uh, uh, development of these rangelands. We helped the local community to collect the water from stony dams, very primitive ones, that they used to do in order to direct water to the rangelands and make it more fertile. We were also able to identify with the local community the most important 14 native species that they always use as fodder so that we can regenerate them, germinate them in the, in the lab and bring them back to the ecosystem so that the end it would look like this. This has been a successful example for sustaining these rangelands and we are still continuously monitoring the area to see what is going on there. We also worked with the local community and for them by giving them incentives and helping them to grow crops and to market their products so that they can have a better livelihood and to try and uh, alleviate the stresses that they pose on ecosystems. We came up with the conclusion that biodiversity in drylands are very important, they are very valuable, and they have genetic traits that, that are very important for the adaptation of such plants to the conditions and stresses going on in the area. The ecosystem services also has to be considered as it is the foundation for the social and economic sustainable development of rangelands in the area. Thank you very much. Our rangelands have been good production spaces that have um, sustained large numbers of wildlife and livestock together. And of course, this combined has also sustained the livelihoods of communities that have lived there. When the rangelands are used well, they're healthy, and for sure, uh, we can we can continue but having open spaces in our rangelands is key to sustaining them today times are changing we have cities growing populations are growing and everybody is looking for their own space and this is really the downfall of our rangelands because if everybody comes to get their own little space and i want to fence it then we we we, we lock all the pathways that allow both wildlife and livestock to move about the, the savannas of uh, the East Africa are human-dominated savannas and are human-made. And therefore, if we cut it from that continuous use by different species, we will uh, make them counterproductive. More land for sale, everybody is coming to grab their piece. However, that said, it's not to say that we cannot have um, frameworks that will allow our rangelands to be uh, productive. Today, we have a lot of trials in Kenya and different parts of, of Africa where we are combining livestock production and conservation, um, particularly in one community here in southern Kenya, where I'm showing where communities have zoned their land 
so that they have areas for conservation, they have areas for livestock production, but interchangeably because livestock conservation areas have also been used as grazing areas during the drought, as grass banks for, 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 for livestock during the drought. So communities find this combination very effective in, in terms of using the space. And you know that, that can be taken to scale because we are only looking at one community there. But if you look at now the space that we're talking about between Kenya and Tanzania, this is Serengeti, Mara ecosystem, and in between our community areas that if we encourage conservation action, we will actually have a bigger space uh, put into rangeland management. Thank you very much. How to boost rangeland restoration and spread sustainable land management SLM widely? From WOCAT, we have four proposals. First, to differentiate solutions per rangeland use system. For instance, the use of rangelands in the plains of East Africa or the mountains of the Himalayas is very different. Additionally, small scale, large scale systems or protected areas have different challenges and solutions. Furthermore, to spread good land management, we need to work with nature and favor nature-based solutions. Second proposal, share and use SLM practices, the wealth of knowledge including traditional, adapted, and also innovative practices. VOCAT hosts the global database recommended by UNCCD and provides tools that help sharing the knowledge. All open access for everybody. Also guidelines like sustainable rangeland management for Sub-Saharan Africa. Third proposal, monitor impacts of good and bad land management both on and off-site to prove their benefits. On-site, where the practice is implemented, for instance, a production increase, enhanced biodiversity and tourism, but also off-site at the distance, for instance, to prove that SLM is needed to reduce downstream flooding and provide dry season flows. Fourth proposal, to use monitored impacts for awareness raising about the value of good land management and evidence-based decision-making for successful and efficient implementation. We conclude, yes, rangelands deserve more support for restorations. Our recommendations differentiate rangelands and work with nature, share knowledge, monitor impacts, use evidence, for awareness raising and better decision making. Rangelands by definition cover tens of thousands of square kilometers with hundreds of thousands of users, niche resources and ecosystem services that support more than 2 billion people across the globe. Land degradation is the single most important threat to rangelands as we know them today. Diminishing land productivity is exposing communities to the impacts of climate change, leading to food and water insecurity. The UNCCD, through the Land Degradation Neutrality Setting Project, is supporting more than 124 countries across the globe to address the issues of land degradation. The world's rangelands has a huge overlap with the countries being supported. It may not seem obvious, but this is a single great opportunity to address rangeland restoration at scale. The HERD initiative by the IUCN is already working with several of these countries to address issues of sustainable rangeland management. We're doing this by building, build, uh, supporting the com communities to build better institutions, generating evidence and information that sustainable land management works, and also generating knowledge that can be able to fit into national and international processes to influence the management of rangelands. LDN has really provided us a platform, but we need to come together as practitioners, donor communities, CSOs, private sector, and all the rangeland actors to be able to amplify this opportunity and to increase investments.
in Ringlands. Thank you. We studied the on and off site impacts of land use change in the floodable savannas of the Cusiana River Basin. This basin covers the Eastern Andes and the lowland floodable savannas. Our area is characterized by eight months of heavy rainfall and floods and four months of severe droughts. Uh, we compared two land use scenarios, one of sustainable land management with proven practices that reduce surface runoff like gallery forest conservation improved pasture management and agroforestry and crop production. During the rainy season, we expect a natural flood pulse that allows for ground, soil, and wetland water recharge. And during the dry season, there will be enough water available for evapotranspiration to enable cloud formation in upstream cloud forests. The other scenario is the extensive land use change, which will drain savannas during the rainy season, uh, leading to destructive flash floods and low soil and groundwater recharge. Therefore, during the dry season, there will be water scarcity, increased demand for of irrigation, and low evapotranspiration for cloud formation in cloud forests, and therefore lower water stream flows. Uh, in order to bring these results to the policy and decision-making level, we produced a raising awareness video and a policy brief that will soon be translated into Spanish for, uh, and shared with local and regional stakeholders. Land use change has also impact on carbon and biodiversity. Wetlands are well-known ecosystems for being key in carbon sequestration. In the case of Orinoco, our plot indicates the shorter the flooded pools, the less soil organic carbon is stored. In the case of biodiversity, the loss of balance between aquatic and terrestrial phases decrease habitat diversity for both permanent and migratory species. So we have identified some sustainable land management technologies using native uh, biodiversity very well adapted to the flood pools instead of introducing exotic production systems, which requires landscape transformation. When you look at these plates, what do you see? You see beautiful ceramics made of many different pieces, a landscape, a mosaic of ceramics. But now let's look at the landscape and the mosaic of landscape of Central Asia. There is a lot of land degradation in Central Asia. And as you can see, why do we need the regional projects? Because as you can see from the map, the challenge is regional. You have the hotspot of land degradation are mainly along the borders. It costs to Central Asia countries over 4% of their gross domestic product. In fact, it affects transboundary infrastructure, transboundary ecosystem, and communities that live at the borders of these countries. So what can we do? We need to have different interventions, some intervention on the ground and some policies. The intervention on the ground can span from silvopastoral system to sustainable land management, to agroforestry and to ecotourism in rangelands. But policies are as important and you can need to have the right incentive for restorations and uh, the, light, the right uh, property rights and uh, the right subsidies. But what is the impact that we are looking for? We are looking for lasting impacts, resilient infrastructure, resilient ecosystems, and resilient communities in the rangelands. I hope that now, when you look at this beautiful mosaic, you will see the thousands of mosaics of opportunities in restoration of landscape in Central Asia that will make the rangelands more resilient. Uh, it will create a vibrant rangeland economy and it will increase the re resilience of the communities. Thank you. Ilri, we intend to support the setting up of a global rangelands data platform. 
this would strengthen partnerships and a consortium on rangelands at the global level. We have been discussing with other CGIR partners and development partners and pastoral networks about what this data platform could look like. As our de development partners agree, there is a significant gap in rangeland data and we urgently need a global data platform to fill this gap in order to support the sustainable development of rangelands, the protection of biodiversity, and for feeding into opportunities for rangeland investments and uh, rangeland restoration opportunities. This data platform we anticipate would consolidate data from, the, from global and national data sets already existing and or ingesting from data platforms. We also anticipate that the data platform would source data from improved Earth observation satellites. And then we want to develop a framework for uh, aligning and um, including data uh, from the national level and ultimately crowdsourcing of local data through pastoral networks. Um, we anticipate piloting this in two countries, in Kenya and Kyrgyzstan, where we know that there are opportunities for collecting data at the local already in place. We anticipate that this data platform will be used globally by multilateral organizations in project design, implementation and monitoring, by national governments for range and degradation and restoration monitoring and investments and fulfilling commitments that these national governments have already made for this by pastoral networks for monitoring trends in pastoral areas and eventually by pastoralists themselves, by CGIR and other science-based institutions. And finally, there are a significant number of UN conventions and events where we want to raise the profile of rangelands and ensure that there is good data uh, available within these. So we have uh, next year coming up, the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration being launched. There is a bond challenge and land degradation neutrality. And there is the anticipated International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralists. All of these and uh, all of our uh, development actors are stressing the need for rangelands data. We anticipate that this platform will help unlock this rangelands data and allow us to provide a data platform that will be useful for all. Grasslands and savannas comprise some 40% of the planet's total land area and represent up to 80% of agriculturally productive land. Despite their importance for agriculture, food security, livelihoods, climate mitigation, and biodiversity, these biomes are facing among the fastest and largest rates of conversion and degradation of any biome, with unsustainable agricultural production being the main driver. We know, for example, that half of the Sahado and the Northern Great Plains have already been lost, and less than 10% of grasslands are under formal protection. Compounding these challenges, an overall lack of awareness of their value has resulted in limited action on the global conservation and climate agendas. To address these challenges, WWF, or the Worldwide Fund for Nature, is developing a global grasslands and savannas initiative aimed at halting biodiversity loss and reducing greenhouse gas emissions in these biomes, as well as improving and restoring ecosystem services. The initiative will be delivered via two work streams. First, a global work stream aimed at building consensus to elevate the profile of grasslands and savannas to the highest levels of international attention, ensuring that they get the investments that they deserve. And second, a landscape level work stream delivering on the ground interventions to protect, better manage and restore these biomes. The first key action under the global work stream of the initiative has been to establish a global grassland and savanna dialogue platform. Launched in July, 2020, the platform's target audience includes NGOs, academics and universities, research institutions, UN organizations, government representatives, producers, ranchers and other practitioners. There were more than 80 participants on the September Dialogue platform call, bringing together the best minds and representing grassland landscapes from around the globe, some of which are shown on this map. 
The dialogue platform was established as a forum to exchange knowledge and encourage replication of impactful approaches to improve maps and monitoring of grassland landscapes, to develop joint policy asks and science papers, and to cooperate on funding opportunities, all to support the preservation of these important biomes. We are excited by the momentum gained for grasslands and savannas thus far, and we welcome you to join us. If you are interested in joining the Global Dialogue platform, please reach out to me on email. You can also check out our new website at globallandusechange.org and click on the Global Grassland and Savanna Dialogue platform. Okay, so now we've finished the, the recorded part of this session and we're coming back to live. Um, it has been my task to run through quickly a summary of the issues raised by these pitches and get us ready for the interactive discussion that will follow. So with help from Rima and Hans-Peter, here we have a quick summary of what we've learned from all these diverse um, experiences about solutions in the rangelands. Um, we know there are so many solutions and we've seen so many beautiful examples presented of work at the very local level with communities and youth in Egypt, in Kenya, in Central Asia, um, in Colombia, and we have so much experience on this call amongst all of the participants with even more knowledge of how to bring solutions for rangeland restoration in different parts of the world. Um, we've also realized from the, the um, points made by Paula and others that we, we have policy solutions and economic solutions and transboundary solutions that we can also think about and introduce. And of course, we have the global level policy solutions with the conventions and the discussion around them. We also have a tremendous body of knowledge available amongst this group and some fantastic tools for example, this platform that we're using is a tremendous tool that can help us to bring together the solutions for the rangelands. And we have knowledge, which is traditional knowledge. We have new emerging knowledge and technologies. We have mobile technologies and all kinds of things that we're learning about. And we're learning to use to help us to understand better what's happening in the rangelands. Um, we can use this knowledge and the models that we have and the systems and the GIS and all of the other fantastic tools to help us understand better the changes that are taking place in the rangelands and also the impacts of the investments that we are making in restoring the rangeland ecosystems. So it's becoming possible to map our investments, to quantify the effects of the investments um, we could move forward to the next slide if, if possible. Um, yes, we can talk about the, the impacts um, that we're achieving in the rangelands, um, quantify them, uh, track them, increase them and improve them, including the on-site impacts on ecosystem services, and also some of the much bigger off-site impacts that colleagues have been highting, uh, highlighting to do with effects on downstream flooding um, and also effects even on downstream river flows, which are supplying the water supply to some of our larger cities in the very dry areas. So we really need to understand these impacts and we have so many tools to help us with this. Um, what we really need to do now is think about how the different communities can come together to apply the tools and the knowledge that we have to understand these impacts. 
we need to bring together the scientific community, the policy community, the donor community, and even the private sector um, to form uh, some kind of coherent approach to looking at what is happening in the rangelands. So um, colleagues are, are suggesting maybe a consortium or a joint commitment, um, some way to really raise awareness and make the most of the opportunities that are coming up in the UN decade for restoration and through the global processes to do with land and biodiversity and climate change. Um, we have tremendous opportunities in front of us. We need to really now get everybody who is on this call um, engaged in a discussion on what really can we do together as a consortium. And so I hope we can go straight into our um, breakout uh, discussion questions and just identify some strong recommendations. Of course, we have a lot of strong recommendations for solutions that are already working in the rangelands and that need to be um, increased and boosted by providing incentives for local communities and the youth to engage in sustainable rangeland management. So topic number one for breakout room number one will be the solutions. The second topic that we really need to look harder at is knowledge. We have a lot of knowledge on this call, a lot of very knowledgeable people. We need to talk about what we can do with this knowledge now, how we can share it, how we can use the new knowledge and the old knowledge together, how we can really make use of the tools that we have to transfer useful knowledge to decision-making and inform investments in rangeland restoration using all of the models and the the, the data collection platforms and everything else that we have and that we will be developing over the coming uh, decade to, to make sure that we do achieve a positive impact in the rangelands. We have to monitor this. Some of us have been talking about this need to monitor the impact of sustainable land management for a very long time now. But, but it's becoming possible in ways that perhaps a decade or two ago we never did imagine. We really can monitor and model on-site effects on ecosystem services now. And we also have tools that are powerful enough to observe and monitor off-site effects on floods, um, low flows, sandstorms, um, all of the rest of these things that are worrying us about the environmental degradation we're seeing from lack of attention to our rangelands. Um, so the, the third topic will be about monitoring the impacts. And then the fourth topic for the breakout rooms will be the practical question of how do we bring together this consortium of all the different communities um, to build a larger community of practice for sustainable rangeland restoration. How do we work with all the communities already in place? Um, and Jessica, please take over and give practical instructions about how we're setting up the breakup room discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Caroline. So thank you for that overview. So shortly, you are going to be put into a breakout room. Um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with Zoom now after this year, and that won't be a surprise to you. But for those of you that haven't used it yet, you'll just have a, a pop up on your screen that you can see here joining breakout rooms. We just want you to accept that. Breakout rooms one to three will join via the link and then breakout room four will remain here in the plenary room. Um, and then it will take a, maybe 30 seconds for your facilitator and note taker to join you. And when they join you, they're going to guide you in a discussion of one of those four topics that uh, Caroline's just explained for us. So we really want you to make the most of this time. We've only got 20 minutes. It's not long. So please feel free to write your reflections in the chat box or use the raise hand function or unmute yourself and share your comments and reflections. And your note taker will be capturing all of that to feed back to us in the plenary. So Ranella, are we ready for our breakout rooms? 
And I would also encourage everyone, please turn your camera on when you're in the breakout room so that you can see everyone. Unfortunately, we don't have much time, so we won't do a round of introductions, but do introduce yourself in the chat box, say where you're coming from, what organization you're from, um, and just make sure, yeah, that you can see each other. That will really help with the discussion. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I hope everyone is ready. I can see, yep, yeah, Renal said we're ready to go. So please enjoy your breakouts, everyone. Hello everyone. For those of you who are staying in the plenary room, um, that means you are in breakout group four to discuss the joint commitment. And we'll just get started in one moment. We'll wait for um, the others to get into their breakout rooms. Alyssa, could you kindly switch your video on? Yes, uh, it was one disabled, second, but are... it's now on. We are still Sorry, assigning Alyssa? the people. Just one second. Hello, Alyssa. I need to join my breakout room. I'm in okay. breakout room one. Have you received an invitation? Yes, one it was second. one. I hadn't pressed on it. I'm James. Okay. I need to join one. Just Sorry, one I second. should be also in three. Just... One second. Sorry. I'm... I think the tech team will take care of you in just a moment. Okay, I'm lost in cyberspace. <laughs> it happens to all of us. <laughs> Good morning. I had the same question. I did not receive the, the invitation to the breakout group. So if you did not receive an in invitation, it probably means that you are in this breakout group, which is breakout group four, which is staying in the plenary yes, group. Oh, they decided for you. You can decide. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Randomly <laughs> okay sorry about that. Yeah. No worries. Well, why don't we get started as um, people are getting Kindly sorted out? Two seconds. Kindly give me two seconds. Oh, sure. No problem. Hi. Hi. Uh, this is Anurag. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I'm in the room uh, as yet. Yes. Is, does that mean I'm? I'm, I'm directed to the. I do apologize. We are just trying to get people into rooms. A button we can press. Just give me kindly, uh, just there are 45 people I need to kindly assign. Thank you. Yeah, just give us one moment and then we'll get started on our breakout group. Thank you for your patience. I do apologize for the delay. Unfortunately, having to assign the moderators has caused that I have to manually assign teams. Lisa, I think you can get started. Uh, there might be a few people that might be moving to impacts knowledge. Okay, no problem. It seems like we've also lost Fiona, who is our note taker, but um, let's just get started since we don't have too much time. 
Um, welcome everyone. So in this breakout room, we are going to discuss the topic of joint commitments and the building of a global community of practice for rangelands. Um, my name is Alyssa Wachter and I'm a part of WWF's global food team and I'm based in Nairobi. So I'll be International Livestock Research Institute and she is our note taker for this session. So she will be taking notes and reporting back the key points to the plenary. Um, if you would like to, it would be great to have you introduce yourself in the chat box just so we know who is in our group. Also, please turn your video on if you're able to um, and then mute, mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, so we have a few discussion questions around the topic of building a global community of practice for rangelands. Um, maybe what I will do is share my screen quickly so that you can see them. And then I will also put them into the chat box. So here are our discussion questions. How might we build and engage a community of practice to improve awareness and collective action around rangeland management? What is already in place that could be strengthened? What is missing or needs to be addressed? And then what are the next concrete steps? So these are our discussion questions. As you heard in the pitch talks, um, there is a, a data platform that's being worked on that Fiona shared about. Um, and then on WWF side, we're working on a global grasslands platform that was just launched a couple of months ago. So these are two things, but I think there are probably many others out there and would love to get your input from this group. So I'm gonna stop sharing so that we can see each other. Um, and then I will also paste the questions into the chat box so that you can have them there. And there they are. So um, feel free to type your comments in the chat box or unmute mute yourself and um, provide some input here. But maybe we can start with the first question on how might we build and engage a community of practice to improve awareness and collective action around rangeland management, keeping in mind what is already being done and what maybe um, needs to be done still. So do we have anyone from the breakout group that would like to contribute first? Anyone have thoughts on um, maybe some comments on the ideas that were introduced in the pitch talk? So this, this idea of this global data platform and then the idea of a global dialogue platform, both for rangelands, grasslands and savannas. We have a quiet group today. <clears throat> Anyone have thoughts maybe on what we can do together as a group of practitioners who are working and care about um, grassland and rangeland management and restoration, what sort of issues that we should um, work together on, you know, things like elevating the profile of grasslands and savannas on climate and conservation agendas, uh, what type of issues should we be working together on and making commitments towards? I can see a couple of comments in the chat box. So integrating knowledge from different knowledge sources and awareness raising actions in local languages and adapted to local cultures to be developed on the subject. Yeah, that's a wonderful idea. I think it make, making sure that we are locally relevant as well. And so being able to um, translate and adapt information and awareness raising tools into um, local context is very important. Oh, uh, sorry, can I jump in? Of course. Okay, uh, sorry, I'm just joining, but I think I got your question. So uh, my suggestion will be perhaps we uh, build a global network of practitioners just like what we have here, share local knowledge. For example, uh, the um, policies or 
could be done maybe in a place and then we could localize it here also. You know, those are kind of issues actually work better if we can, you know, have, you know, like a platform for sharing local knowledge at one and then supporting each other also in a way that it's uh, easy for us to share knowledge. You know, that's what I think I just see on the fly. Yeah, thank you, Yusuf. You were cutting out a little bit, but I think we heard most of what you were saying. Um, having sort of a global platform to bring practitioners together and then also being able to take that to our local context and adapt it as well. Um, and I think also, you know, something that's great about having a global platform is oftentimes we face issues or challenges in our own landscapes and contexts. And we don't realize that those things are happening elsewhere. And there are a lot of lessons learned that can be shared across um, landscapes and across, across continents. And I think having a global platform really highlights those issues and allows us to learn from each other. May I add? Of course. Well, uh, I believe that uh, what is really needed is uh, a systematic approach uh, which we can offer uh, to the decision makers uh, in uh, the countries and also in the regions where it is uh, possible. And uh, that systematic approach uh, should consist uh, at least uh, from uh, three components to be uh, clearly um, understandable and uh, useful. And the first co component uh, should be a generation of uh, scientific uh, evidence uh, on uh, different aspects uh, of uh, rangelands uh, management, uh, including uh, uh, including uh, the land degradation uh, impact uh, on uh, biodiversity, economic uh, efficiency of uh, land use, and uh, uh, social. Uh, impact of uh, land uh, use on uh, local communities, especially smallholders. So that should be, should be the first uh, component. The second component is uh, uh, should be uh, policy formulations, policies uh, which would uh, actually stipulate uh, how uh, and which actions are uh, needed uh, to uh, improve uh, sustainable management uh, of uh, uh, the rangelands. And uh, third uh, should be a demonstration of uh, best uh, practices. Uh, so uh, it would be not purely scientific, uh, not purely theoretical uh, research. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, it should be shown on the ground how things work and then those which work in particular countries could be scaled up. So I believe there should be that system which should consist at least from these three components, maybe more. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So the three components being scientific evidence, specific policy recommendations and demonstration of best practices, all crucially important, yes. So, so maybe, um, hello, I'm also <laughs> in Elisa's team, and I really would like to encourage you all. So we have set up this global dialogue platform, and everybody who is interested, send us an email. You, we are really happy to integrate you exactly to start this discussion on raising awareness at the different level, bringing science people together, and also have this kind of uh, practical exchange. And we still hope one day we will all meet at the ICN conference whenever it will happen. But uh, that's already something to bring and to strengthen um, this topic. And the other thing is, I think what is important for all of you are, who are somehow uh, involved in this um, upcoming huge conference is the Climate COP, the Biodiversity COP, the Food Summit, bring in the rangeland and grassland topic. So uh, in the global biodiversity framework, we should not miss this topic and the same also at the UN uh, C COP in autumn next year. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Martina. Yes, hi, Bora. Good morning, my name is Bora. I'm with uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. I think there is something fundamental here is about strengthening knowledge. It's very important to, someone talked about bringing together 
uh, different people. I think it's very important to bring together scientists, practitioners, and even the private sector to get them to understand the value of financial and so also, of course, government um, offices so that they understand the value of rangelands and then they commit themselves to increase investment in rangelands. Something that is also very important, I think, is the good practices. So let's try and adopt good practices that are validated and that also can be uh, put at scale. And also uh, something I think that is very important is to work across sectors we need to understand that when we uh, restore rangelands, it will not only provide benefits to pastoralists or to rangeland ecosystems, but also to biodiversity conservation. It will increase, it will improve biodiversity. Uh, it will improve our uh, climate change uh, regulation. So um, I think there is also something to look at, you know, when we want to restore rangeland, try to see how we can work across sector. And then when we build this dialogue, around rangelands restoration. We need to bring all these different sectors together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bora. I also just want to acknowledge the comments coming in on the chat box. So there's one around encouraging the community to increase the value of rangeland by adding financial values, such as through ecotourism. Um, there's also a comment about how the global platform could function like a one-stop shop um, where you enter the platform saying, here's how I want to engage. I want to volunteer. I want to participate in activity days. I want to search for partners. So that's sort of a starting point. And then um, sort of entering your specific interests. So say water management and then your geographic location. And so that gives you some options about how to engage. Um, I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, and hopefully with the dialogue platform that we've set up, it will evolve over time and become a little more sophisticated in that regard and um, allow people to engage in specific ways. Um, and then Kevin, I see your comment around a lack of data in these often global sets and global data platforms um, that often lack data from Africa, which is definitely a challenge and a problem. Um, I don't know if Fiona's in the group, if, if Fiona, if you're here, if you're able to comment on that um, regarding the global data platform. It looks like she may have dropped off. Hi, Alisa, could I comment maybe course, further yeah. on what I'd written here? Yeah. Thanks, thanks, yeah. Alisa. Thanks, uh, because I've been part of uh, several uh, global initiatives regarding uh, restoration of uh, rangelands and drylands uh, globally on aspects of uh, both plant and soil uh, of this particular biomes. But from my experience, I've seen there is a lot of, you know, like uh, a gap, a gap of uh, lack of lack of data from uh, Africa, and what is available mostly is from the south, because at least there have been a lot of you know, researchers doing a lot of this work in South Africa. But uh, most of this global, uh, uh, it's called what uh, the networks have been part of, have actually lacked a lot of. Uh, data sets from, from Africa. And I think it will be important for, for us from this particular initiative, you know, because I believe there's a lot of information, there's a lot of uh, data available from the continent, but how does this data reach out to the rest of the world to be able to inform you know, policy, for example, you know, decision-making in the global map? Because this is something which I find a bit uh, uh, like a disconnect on aspects of uh, Rangeland, because there's a lot going on, but not a lot is being seen or heard. So it's like operating in a in a dark room where nobody sees what's happening, and it appears that there's nothing happening. But in real sense, there's a lot. So I think there's this is a, a challenge which you need to to take. Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin. And that's very yeah. true. I mean, there is so much happening on the continent um, regarding rangelands management and restoration and protection. Um, and elevating that so that it's seen and heard and integrated into global policy and decision making is extremely important. Um, and I hope that we would be able to accomplish that through a global uh, data platform and dialogue platform. So thank you for that important point. I'd like to make um, a comment here on uh... On this platform related to the platform um uh, talking 
talking impact on uh, on these projects and uh, getting giving uh, race up management a higher profile in the in the world of uh, of uh, um, in, improved lab management will especially require that that data is made available at a local level where decisions are being made on improved uh, systems and um, uh, management decisions and and management options so uh, linking back to um, what the previous uh, speaker said about uh, having information localized and engage local partners it's important to have uh, not just a global new global platform uh, but making sure that the, the data and the resources from that platform originate from um, local resources and um, are used by people at a local level. Thank you. That's for me. Oh, sorry. And uh, introducing myself, I'm Andre Koyman from uh, ISRIC uh, World Soil Information in Wageningen, Netherlands. Great. Thank you so much, Andre. Thank Yeah, one, one more comment. Now we are at it. Um, I have been looking at, at data sources ourselves. ISRIC is, uh, is presenting soil information, global soil information itself. Been struggling with the issue I was just mentioning. Get data from the, from the global to the local level. Um, I also noticed that there were many platforms that have been set up for similar issues on improved sustainable land management. WOCAT databases have been mentioned, which are important resource. Um, I have noticed that uh, CGIAR is already in, uh, involved through ICARDA in, uh, in an, a platform on uh, improved rangeland management in dry lands, especially not limited to rangelands. Um, it might be useful for such an initiative, setting up a new platform to uh, reach out to, to consider carefully what is already there and not limit to rangeland management as a, a new entry. That's especially because rangeland do not exist in isolation. They are part of a larger uh, system of, of land users. And very often what I've seen in Africa, Asia, is that rangelands are, um, or rangeland management is part of activities of local people, which also includes food production, arable agriculture, uh, forest management, fuel wood forestry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, I, I recommend to um, uh, to look at existing initiatives, to look at a broader set of land uses, of rangeland embedded in other in other land uses than just uh, rangeland management sec. Um, and then two more comments. One is on on additional. Uh, opportunities for for monitoring impact, for creating impact and monitoring impact. Um, uh, discussions are being held on uh, on using the soil organic carbon uh, changes as an incentive for improved for projects on improved range man, um, improved land management. Many of these discussions are centered around arable agriculture. Uh, it will be extremely important to consider uh, rangeland management in that discussion as well, and that would be an opportunity for uh, to get uh, rangeland management, sustainable range management in the food light, and also link to carbon credit schemes and uh, and other opportunities. That's from my end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andre. I would I'm like just... to yes. Ah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I would like to follow up on the previous comment about uh, availability of uh, data. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, it is a very important uh, issue, uh, but also what is uh, even more important probably is uh, uh, the opportunity to, uh, uh, to interpret uh, the data, to uh, understand uh, what exactly the data means and uh, how exactly it impacts uh, on uh, all uh, three aspects of sustainability, uh, environmental, economic, uh, social. And um, uh, as uh, we are talking about uh, rangelands and rangelands are uh, very often more mostly used uh, by uh, livestock for livestock uh, production. I would like to 
note uh, that uh, uh, FAO uh, is uh, working on uh, development of uh, several methodologies uh, which uh, can be used uh, to assess impact of livestock on different aspects of the environment. Uh, most of these methodologies uh, are applicable to rangeland management. For example, one of the methodologies just uh, recently uh, finalized and uh, available for uh, practical application is uh, the methodology for assessment of livestock impact on the biodiversity. It is uh, very relevant to range management. Also, there are uh, methodologies for assessment of livestock impact uh, on a carbon soil. Also, on uh, water management, uh, also assessment of uh, uh, nutrients uh, cycles. So there, are, there is a set of such methodologies and uh, all of them are developed not only by our experts at FAO, but it was a team work of top global experts, dozens of experts from around the world. Uh, so if uh, any one of you would be interested to learn more about this work, because it's really, really very sophisticated and um, very serious and very useful work, uh, uh, very uh, applicable in uh, the practice. I can share with you the links uh, to, to this uh, publication and uh, uh, we can discuss further how these tools for interpreting data, for uh, making sense of the data can be used uh, for improving uh, sustainable management of the rangelands. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, may I also follow up on that too? Of course, yeah. Yes, so I think, uh, of course, we will uh, raise many issues about data, but one thing we shouldn't forget is, of course, interpreting data as well. So I think it's also important for us to just have that in mind. And then uh, let's see how best we can share knowledge around that too, because, uh, uh, yeah, data is gathering data is one thing, understanding them is another, interpreting them is also another thing. And then ensuring uh, they find their way into policy is also another thing. So when we match all this together, we're definitely going to you know make a whole lot of sense from this whole issue of uh, rangeland restoration and health. So I think that's uh, not also, and then one final thing, we should not also forget that uh, what is applicable in one domain may not really be applicable in another because our regions are different and then uh, these old issues are actually not uniform like we see, but uh, what do I hope everybody understands the idea though. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm hearing from a few of you, not just collecting data for data's sake, but actually having the data, understanding how to interpret it and then how to use it both globally and at a local level to change policy to influence um, decision makers. I think that's a very important point. And I'm seeing some similar comments in the chat box as well. Um, one suggestion to um, facilitate regional networks um, within a global platform that can feed into a global platform. I think this topic has come up a couple of times in this conversation, just that importance of um, local adaptation. So whatever we're talking about and whatever tools we develop and, and all of those should be um, not just created at a global level and then pushed down to to lo the local level, but actually quite the opposite, where um, it should be driven more by the regional and local conversations happening to feed up to a global platform. It looks like we have two uh, minutes. Any other comments? Yes, I also want to follow up quickly on the last speaker about the resources and intent to share. I don't know if it's okay. I already dropped my mail on the chat box. Maybe that's uh, okay. Great, yes, I've seen your email there, so we can get in touch with you. And yes, Kevin, this is a very good point. Um, oftentimes rangelands are seen as degraded forests and they are not, and they um, rather have their own value in and of themselves. And so this is a, a, an important part of the awareness raising globally is to, um, yeah, change sort of the, the misconception about 
grasslands and rangelands as being degraded forests, but actually that they are valuable in and of themselves. One minute left. Any final comments? Colleague, I shared a link to the Great. guidelines on uh, assessment of uh, different aspects of livestock impact on the environment, which I mentioned in my previous uh, comment. So you can follow up and uh, download uh, the guidelines if you are interested. Thank you, Yuri. Well, thank you everyone for this great discussion. I will try to summarize um, all that has been said and report back to the main group um, once we are back in the group. But I really appreciate all of your comments and your insights. Um, and we'll definitely, we've taken a lot of notes and we'll incorporate these this into at least how we're thinking about this global dialogue platform and the global data platform. So now I believe in a couple of seconds, everyone will be coming back to this plenary. Thanks everyone. Participants now have 60 seconds to return to the main room. Thank you everyone for your patience. This has been a interesting exercise. I believe we have everyone returned. We will now have Jessica. Welcome back, Hans Peter. Okay, yes, well, welcome back, everybody. We thought Jessica is going to, to open the, the feedback from the breakout groups. I'm just waiting for her to return into the Zoom room. Yes. We realize that uh, time is short. We always have that problem could have spent quite some more time on, in that breakout group, probably the same experience to the other people as well. Okay, just a quick feedback then from the breakout groups. Yes, Jessica, you're back. I was trying to capture all the last comments from the chat box. So thank you everyone for your contributions in the breakouts. I hope that was all really interesting. There were certainly a lot of really interesting points shared in ours. Before we hear back, we're just gonna do another quick poll. So get ready for some, uh, a question on rangeland engagement. So in which activity are you planning to engage within the next year? So you can tick all the ones that you think apply to you. So this is really looking forward to that fourth point around um, joining people together for joint commitment, joint action. Um, you know, is it going to be a consortium, a community of practice, a coalition? Um, what are you going to be involved in next year? And so thank you. I can see we're getting some votes already. So you, will you be participating in events? Will you be looking at raising awareness? Will you be strengthening support for local communities? Looking at new initiatives? Sharing and promoting solutions? So we're running short of time, I know, so I'm not gonna give you very long for this. So maybe 10 more seconds and we'll see which one you're all planning to take part in until the end of next year. Okay, I'm going to end the polling now.
Thank you, everyone. 70% of you voted, so that's, I think, a good, oh, 75%. And I can see another few uh, messages in the chat, creating shared value from Eddie, but let's have a look at the results. So active participation in events has come out top. So let's hope that that means more events more coming together and we will have a survey that I'm, uh, we're going to share with you at the end of the session and it will also be available in the exhibition booth. I hope you've had time to visit all the session host exhibition booths during the conference but please do fill out the survey because that's where you'll be able to leave your email and then if you did want to continue to be a part of this community next year we'll be able to contact you. So if we could now hear back very, very briefly from the um, breakout room facilitators, who have we got in room one who that's going to share back to us a brief summary? Yep. So I'll start. Chris here. Thanks, Chris. Good. Um, let me, sorry, let's share the screen. There you go. Yes. Okay, not that. Sorry, that took a bit. Oops, I'm not getting the right screen. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to get the right screen to share. Can you see that now? Yeah, we can see the Jamboard solutions per rangeland system. Let's how might we it. raise awareness? Good. So, how might we raise awareness? So, one of the key things was governments need to be central to awareness raising, and uh, should find ways of cascading this um, awareness, you know, all the way to local communities. One of the key things that we also questions we asked was. Whose awareness are we raising? Is it the governments, the local communities, NGOs, policy makers? So that needs to be clear. Um, and based on who the awareness is being raised for, we need communication strategies on that, uh, that target specific groups. Uh, leverage on social media, that was, came out quite strongly, uh, the new technologies. We need stories from local communities where the change is happening. Uh, that can be able to demonstrate the challenges and also the successes. Build on local initiatives from the ground uh, when you're thinking about communication. And then more importantly, also generate evidence on sustainable run, land management. I think this is related to stories from the ground. Uh, and then one other aspect came is that we are starting to forget the value of, of biodiversity in many cases, including rangelands. People should be reminded of this uh, in, in certain contexts that you know rangelands are particularly good, rich places um, with rich biodiversity and that came that. So how, how may we create incentives for this? Use of technology that came out quite clearly. When we talk about engaging youth, we have to talk about technology and how that can apply to them. Generating green jobs uh, for, for, from rangeland management. Thinking more keenly about private public partnerships and how those partnerships can create incentives when you talk about land management. Uh, again, demonstrating that uh, sustainable land management works, which means that it generates better income compared to other alternative land users. Uh, there's uh, an example of conservancies that uh, was presented and it can be one approach that can provide benefits um, from land management for communities. Then recognizing the roles of different users uh, when you talk about employment uh, within this conservancy that also came, came out clearly. Uh, using market-based incentives, for example, tax breaks uh, for people who are managing the land uh, sustainably, things like that. And I think uh, that came out, uh, but also land tenor security as linked to sustainable land management. So these were a few of the, this, uh, of the points that came out, but uh, if there's anything that I'm forgetting, maybe someone can just jut in. And just... 
Thank you, Chris. Thanks so much. Great, great. Can we have breakout room two, please? Thank you very much, Chris, for that lovely summary. And just a, a note that we're just giving you two minutes as we are a little bit over time. So yes. over to you. Yes, hi, Kim here. Yeah. Breakout room two. Can you all see my Jamboard? We can, and it looks very full. <laughs> Yes, I'm not as um, as organized as Chris is, and I jumped in a little bit late. So Paula and um, and Rima, please yes support me if if I miss anything. But I think the so what is needed to further share old and new knowledge such as nature based solutions and make it accessible to communities, decision makers, planners, and implementers. So we jumped around on a few topics here, but something that came out very strongly first and foremost is this idea of valuing rangelands, which also was noted in, in you know, the, the importance of raising awareness also. So valuing rangelands, the offsite benefits, but also on-site benefits, so ecosystem services, which can go beyond. Um, and then here, the economic values and also the ecosystem services. And we, we sort of went off on different tangents talking about including cultural services and the importance of traditional knowledge when, you, when it comes to valuing rangelands, but also um, customary rights, which is linked to that and the role of governance in, in that sense. So then we, we sort of went into another rabbit hole of, of policies and how important it is to have inclusive policies, but then what is needed and what knowledge is, is relevant to that. And the knowledge there is based on multi-stakeholder alliances or bringing the right people together. And here there was a, a strong focus on the, the importance of local communities and how to include local communities in inclusive policies and and how that comes about in when we value rangelands. So this is not only the link between civil society and the private sector, but also making that link between practice, research, and policy making. And that all fun, falls under the umbrella of valuing rangelands. And then in green here, there are a few notes from the from the chat box. So the importance of governance systems and the and simply the fact that pastoralists aren't recognized by governance. So there's also that legal recognition that's an issue there. And then in terms of sort of knowledge sharing, um, we, we spoke about global platforms on rangelands, the importance of that and the importance of documentation and standard tools. And that if we are to support decision-making in that regard with decision-making um, frameworks, that they should be co-developed with relevant stakeholders. So just to wrap that up then valuing rangelands sort of needs to be rooted in local communities and needs to have participatory processes that then can feed into policies and link practices and the private sector and the civil society as well to capture those economic values as well as the ecosystem service values. Rima and, and Paula, if there's anything you'd like to add? Yes, I have only one, uh, one thing that to add because it was said, so are we reinventing the wheel for rangelands now? and uh, where are the new ideas? And I would like to highlight one new idea, which is that to have a standardized online uh, decision-making platform. So, um, and that this, um, so that, and to help, and not only for, for uh, the decision makers, but also where local communities and everybody can actually um, uh, be on this platform and make use of all the tools and the knowledge that is there. So it's more the online idea of it. Thank you. Yes, great. That's, that's it then from our end. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kim. That was great. Um, so I will now share my screen because we were in breakout group three. So just one second. Okay, so I hope everyone can see that probably overwhelmed completely. So our first question, how might we prove the multiple benefits services of healthy rangelands, both on-site and off-site? So we started off um, talking about in some areas whether the land was indeed uh, rangelands or whether it was degraded forest um, and whether it should be restored as rangeland or forest and that's obviously um, a topic to be explored. Um, 
then the other topic was that rangelands aren't that sexy. So how do we raise awareness? How do we really show the benefits? Um, how do we challenge these misconceptions or different perspectives of what that land actually is? Um, and who do we, how do we acknowledge who is managing those territories? Um, and perhaps there's, we were talking about the, the different conception of who's degrading most perhaps in the landscape. So is it the pastoralists, people cutting timber, the farmers, um, and really it's these perceptions that are driving people's actions. So again, it was very much a need for participatory management, conversation with the land users, um, and planning and tenure needs to also be addressed. And um, so those things I feel really need to be addressed before we can even get on to proving the benefits is kind of really having those conversations and participatory approaches with all the different people and kind of getting on the same page around people's perceptions. Um, we, we had a little bit of offsite benefits um, around flooding um, and the what else do we have here? Carbon sequestration. So this, you know, the challenge that rangelands are really, really big areas so that there, there is always an impact off site um, and that's not always considered. You can see that there's a lot of comments here that I was trying to capture from the chat box as well as the conversation. Um, so, you know, Hans Peter, if you want to jump in and say anything else, but I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to go to the next question which is how might we address knowledge gaps? So very similar to what Kim was saying, really, that there's a real need to engage local communities. Um, but we also spoke about um, decision makers, policy makers, perhaps policy briefs don't have enough impact. Um, there's this huge knowledge gap that maybe the decision makers actually aren't aware of the people, the local communities in the areas, they don't think of them. Um, so there's kind of one, a disconnection from the landscape itself, and also this kind of challenge between communicating that knowledge and information to the people that need it. And perhaps that flow of knowledge doesn't always reach the places it needs to be. Um, and sometimes the language is um, a little bit inaccessible and sometimes scientists need support with communication. So all those different challenges of making the under everyone understand the situation in the same way from these, but acknowledging these different perspectives as well. Um, and then the other things that we were looking at were kind of using technology to empower or enable local communities to um, be involved in um, participatory management and um, data in real time. But that there was also a real complexity there. So rangelands are complex and not easy to understand. Um, seasonality also um, contributes to that complexity. So lots and lots of things to consider. Um, and you know, also this thing of responsibility. So if rangelands aren't under a particular department in a government, then, then no one is responsible for them. So there's a real need to kind of give that responsibility perhaps to the local community in terms of sustainable management. And then we were looking at incentives. So of course, the question of tenure and lands rights came up because in order to incentivize local communities, of course, they need to ensure that they have the security of the land that they are working on. Would anyone else from my group like to add anything that I might have missed before we move on to group four? I'll take that as a no. So group four, would you like to go? Sure, I think our note taker may have dropped off, but I'd be happy to give a verbal update of what we discussed. Um, so in our group, we were talking about joint commitments and sort of a, a joint um, practitioners group and the importance of data as well. So on the topic of data, um, one thing that we discussed was, of course, collecting the right data and having the right data is extremely important, but even more important is being able to interpret that data. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just, wait. one second. Um, being able to interpret the data and then using it to actually influence policy and decision makers um, with scientific evidence, with specific policy recommendations, and with demonstration of best practices. Um, so I think that's sort of the, the key thing that's missing. We also talked a lot about contextualization, um, that a global platform that's bringing everyone together and sharing lessons learned is extremely important, um, but we also need regional groups and relevance for local contexts on such a platform to ensure that the data and the tools coming from the local are coming from the local level um, and up to the global level instead of vice versa. Um, the importance of including a wide range of stakeholders and working across sectors. Um, we also talked about uh, just that the time is right for a global uh, practitioners platform for rangelands 
And, um, you know, partly because we have all of these upcoming commitments like the post 2020 global biodiversity framework, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, um, the international year of rangelands and pastoralists. And so the time is right um, to really elevate um, the profile of grasslands and savannas and rangelands in these global platforms. Um, I guess the final thing is we talked a little bit about how operationally um, a, such a, a, a global dialogue might um, be facilitated and how people might engage, you know, based on their geography and their interest and, and how they want to engage with an, um, such a platform and sort of which type of organization they represent. So those are a few things we talked about. Um, there were many others, but just to keep it short, I'll leave it at that. And just to say, I didn't drop off. Several of us got moved. Uh, okay, no problem. Yeah, so you lost a few of us. We ended up in Rima's group, but okay, you can no worries instead. Thanks so much, Alyssa, for that really great summary. So we've just got five more minutes of your time. If you're okay to stay with us, we're going to have a little bit of a wrap up now. Um, and then um, some next steps. How can we really build on, on everything that's been shared today and these connections that have been made? So over to you, Hans-Peter. Yes, thank you very much. Very rich feedback. And I think it's, I'm happy that we made these breakout rooms, but it, it really shows again, if we want to be participatory, we need more time. So we were really short, uh, short in time and but very valuable. The discussion can continue as it is written in the chat. There's a possibility afterwards in, in, a, in, in a exhibitors room that we can continue. We have to come to a closing. Can we have the last slides please from the presentation? And then I would ask Chris please to, to, to make the start. No, one, one further up, that is one before. Just a quick, uh, can you go back in the presentation? One more slide. Yeah, uh, one, no, yeah. yeah, okay, Chris, yes. please. I'll, I'll make this very brief and I think I'd like to thank you all for, you know, your vibrant participation. Some of the things that came out of, um, of the discussions and the presentations today, one is that mobility is key. And I think that is one thing we agree to when we talk about sustainable range and management. Local communities must make part and parcel of these discussions when you talk about range and management and we talk about pastoralists. When we're talking about the knowledge, we need to generate relevant data. We need to generate data about the values of rangelands. This needs to go through a participatory process so that we are talking about what rangeland communities themselves desire. The impact um, around, around um, what's happening in rangelands needs to be monitored. And this, in this, one of the things that we need to really understand is that rangelands, we can only manage them best at scale, which means that we have to understand totally what is happening social, social eco economic, and also the ecological interactions within the landscapes and how these are affecting the rangelands in context. Technology remains key and we need to incentivize communities and uh, people when we talk about that. All this needs to be done in a context where we can scale up. So how do we get actors together when we're talking about the different um, approaches that we have? So, Contextually, this is it. One of the things that also came out and that we are missing in this discussion is the aspect of engagement of youth. I think it came out in the discussions, but in the presentations, we still need to query this a bit more. How can we get youth more engaged when we talk about sustainable land management? So there is need for further awareness, uh, as we know, and this has been elaborated, and we need to raise the bar when you talk about commitment to rangeland management and, and global restoration. So I'll leave it at this um, and give it, send it back to Hans-Peter to take us through the last session. 
Yes, thank you very much, Chris, and to everybody. Yes, we are at the last slide here. <laughs> yes, we created yesterday Grasis, an, a movement <laughs> that we are saying it's absolutely needed now. Grassland restoration approach, securing societies and ecosystems. We've heard it so many times that the solution to restor uh, for restoration is trees. And we would say in the rangelands, it's grasses. So we need now a community of practice, a, a consortium, a coalition to support rangeland awareness. This was coming up again and again. And we were thinking because the grasses already get quite some interest. I saw yesterday also from Mongolia, the green gold, they call it the green gold, the grass, a very nice project there that supports this idea as well and has proven that this is the way forward. Okay, what we need, what we would like to propose is every year till 2026, where we have the International Year of the Rangelands, that we do an exercise, we do a, 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 a dedicated um, a, a project or a dedicated uh, activity like we've done now, maybe every year in one of the global regions. So all in all, we have uh, five years to go, five rangelands, five continents. We could do that involving the youth, showing their involvement, their vision in and outside the rangelands, research, young students could be included there. And the video was getting high attention, even though we did it with very small resources. We need to have more of these awareness raising videos, maybe policy briefs as well. And bringing these results to the UN events, the Global Land Day and so, so on. So we would need a group of people to do that and also a, a, a mandate and also a, a small financial pot that this can be done. So human resources and some financial resources up to the year 2026 when we have this uh, international year of rangelands. So this is our proposal. Please help us. There's a follow up in the end. You can do a small uh, survey and give us a feedback where you would like to engage. Help us to, to shape this whole activities, do something concrete every year till the year 2026. Okay, from, from uh, that point of view, we would like to thank you all for this um, uh, lively uh, meeting that we had, interactive, lots of comments. We will follow up. There's so many comments in the chats and suggestions that we still have to digest. So thank you to everybody who contributed, also the pitch talks and the video and so on. It's a lot of work behind the, the scene here. And we need to continue. We need more engagement uh, for, the, for the future. Let us know whether you're part of it. And I would just like to, to point out that at 12.30, there's a global landscape forum in action, a kicking off the first GLF chapters and announcing the restoration stewards. Please have a look into that one. I think it's also related to youth. With this, Chris, anything from your side? We would like to, to, to stop this meeting. We have gone a bit over time and I hope we still have more energy for the future. Thank you very much to everybody, also the yes, organizers. Thank you very much. You are more than welcome to switch your videos on to wave goodbye to everyone. Yes, show your faces. <laughs> thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, thank you everyone. Okay. Thank you. Let's stay in touch, keep in contact. <laughs> Thank you, Rima. <laughs> Bye, Special everyone. Bye. Hello. Bye. 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 Bye bye, yes, lovely. Caroline, I can still see. Okay, good. Bye, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. For some reason, my video is muted, but thanks, Hans Peter. Uh, thanks, Anurag. Jessica, Chris. Uh, well done, really. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Paolo. And everybody's name. We are always short of time. That is our major problem. <laughs> but everyone, in 60 seconds, we will end the session. You still have time to say goodbye. Okay. Put on your screen quickly, your video. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining from across the globe.